have oh, I have one. We're going to add under new business a request for a leave of absence. And Charlie? Under the Finance Subcommittee, we will um, do a vote on the increase of the hot lunch or set the hot lunch price of milk for the coming year. Any others? Uh, seeing none, we'll go on to approval of school board minutes. We have three sets of minutes. Um, anybody have any changes for organizational meeting Monday, June 12th? Any for regular school board meeting Tuesday, June 13th? And any for the special school board meeting Tuesday, July 18th? Seeing none, the three sets of minutes stand approved. The next item on the agenda is communications. Does anyone have any communications? Keith. I'd just like to make mention that there's uh, a new group being formed, uh, the Music Boosters Group, uh, to, to uh, support and uh, do some fundraising for our, our music groups. Uh, for now, it's going to be the, just a high school group, but it will be uh, eventually, I think, turn into a, a system-wide support group. They're having a, uh, their first full uh, open meeting is going to be September 11th at 7 p.m. in the uh, high, high school cafeteria. Thank you. Connie? I just want to call to your attention, we did include it in the packet a letter from Todd Smith, who was the Human Resource Director at National Semiconductor. Um, we had asked for a contribution towards the Biosphere 2 project, which Gail Ed said is heading up at the high school, and they did, in fact, send us a check for $500. We appreciate that. have, of course, responded and thanked them, and I certainly want to invite the board to become aware of and visit that project as it becomes up and running this uh, that, just to clarify, that's not a project that's going to be um, on the campus with the kids in a biosphere. It's a computerized connection to the Biosphere 2 project. Thank you. Any others? Next item on the agenda is superintendent's report. Honey? And we're going to start tonight with a report that we had uh, originally thought we might be doing in June. Uh, we have two teachers here, Kelly Hassan and Lisa Martin, who went to the International Reading Association convention last spring. You have some information in your packet, uh, and they have more to share with you. This was a, uh, as I think you may recall from our discussion, backing, sending them, as well as uh, the information that you had previously, um, a very compacted kind of concentrated look at uh, many, many reading issues. Um, so I'd like to invite them to give a little rundown on this. And Kelly and Lisa, thank you for coming in on a warm evening. Hello. Um, first, I want Kelly and I want to apologize for not being here. It was truly a misunderstanding. And thank you for your patience for waiting for us till August. Um, and we also want to thank you once again for the privilege of having been sent out to California. It truly was an honor. And um, we, we do encourage other people to go, but realize that it is um, not something that a lot of people will be able to do on a regular basis. Uh, it was a, a wonderful conference. Kelly and I both agree that it was probably one of the best conferences we've ever attended. Um, the scope was just huge. Um, the, the number of sessions that we were able to attend um, number about 50 at any given time. Um, there were the catalog itself was about 300 pages long, and the ch so the choices were just amazing. The um, and to give you an idea of how large the conference was, the, the regional conference, the NERA conferences are about 2,000 people. This conference, um, there were about 20,000 people attending. Um, the, the other fascinating thing for us was that um, we, were be, we were exposed to a wide range of, of educators. There were professors there, children's authors, researchers, 
deans of colleges and teachers from all over the country and to have the opportunity to listen to them in, in workshops and also to sit down at a table and really talk to them was, was wonderful. Um, some of the, the best things that we got from, well, I don't know if it was the best, but some of the very valuable things that we got from it was the exposure to all those people, the time to reflect on what we do as educators, to have a week where our focus wasn't distracted, where we could really think about what are we doing as educators, what do we want to do better, what are we doing currently that, that may need some revising, and not be distracted by thinking about getting those sub plans for the next day, not thinking about, um, I hope the sub did okay today. Um, it, was, it was a luxury. Um, and we also benefited from being together for a week. I learned so much about first grade during that week, and Kelly learned a lot about, about third grade. Having the time to do that, sort of 24 hours a day, for, for five or six days was, was beneficial. Um, Kelly's gonna give a little talk about some of the theory, behind, the newest theory behind what we learned. Um, we're gonna each talk about the, the different areas that we saw which were in the original letter we gave to you in, in May, I believe it was. But before we do that, first I wanted to explain to you the underlying theories that are behind most of what was at the convention. Um, throughout, throughout the week, there was a, an underlying theory that just seemed to prevail in almost every session. Um, and it was really from a shift in developmental theories that is currently going on and has been for the past few years, but it's, it's a significant change in what has been in education for the, really the past 20 years. Um, in this, throughout the 70s and the 80s, when we had more um, developmental education stemming from Piaget's work, Swiss psychologist, um, at that time it was more that education should follow the development of the child and that you really should not push the child any further than he or she was ready and that's where we, we had, that's when we had all our our pre-kindergartens, our transitional classrooms, and there was a real push for not hurrying the child, like in David Elkind's book, The Hurry Child. Um, now what we're seeing is a shift in a, a different theorist who is actually a, a late Russian psychologist, Ellis Vygotsky, and his name came up repeatedly in almost every session. There was some reference to him. Um, and what this theory is saying is that instead of the education following the development of the child, that the, the development of the child is actually enhanced by education. And um, probably the most significant piece is what Vygotsky termed is his zone of proximal development. And it's taking, I'm, I'm going to try and not sound pedantic and try to sort of condense this, but um, taking the, a child's actual development, like for example, like what you may see on a, on a standardized test, a child's standardized test score, and it may reflect that that child is performing um, on an eight-year-old level. And then you're looking at the child's potential development here. The child, you can see the performances here, but there's this, there's this space in the middle of where the child really can, can perform further. And it's, it's probing beyond just a number or what you see as sort of an overt performance. And throughout all our sessions um, was reference to this and, and, how, and how teachers, educators can look beyond that. And it might be through inquiry, it might be through, um, it has enormous implications for assessment, really pushing for authentic assessment where the direct observation by the teacher is key and how you can, you know, a child may, Two children may give you the same answer, but you look beyond that and you and you find out what is the process, how did they get, how did they arrive at that answer, and you see that one child's potential may be here, you know, and the other one may be more at a literal level, and you work with that, you work within that zone. And um, we found, I, I've done some reading this summer about it, but we found throughout all, all of the sessions um, that, that there was a lot of work to be done and is continuing to be done. 
He died in the 30s. I mean, it, this is sort of a, a resurrected um, form of psychology that educators are finding, but that his work is being expanded and being looked at. So I think you're going to see a lot more of, of that coming, and you'll hear his name. But that is really the theme of where the authentic assessments are coming from. And to look beyond, standardized tests may have their place, but you need to look beyond that and how, what information you're going to gather from that and what is more significant here. And really pushing for not just the performance of the child, the product, but the process of how the child gets there. So that was, um, and what we'll tell you, you might, you might see we may refer to some of his work and, and how that will relate to um, education, and assessment, and instructional input. Actually, I think talking about the assessment ne next might make that connection clearer than some of the other. Okay. Um, assessment was, we saw just about every form of assessment we could um, out there. And I, I gave Connie and I gave Nancy and Tom um, an overview of these assessments. And if the board is interested, I, we can have copies made for you as well, um, really giving in-depth in detail about the assessment information. Um, the form of assessment that was most widely advocated out there um, was the portfolio process. And at Pont Cove, we've done that um, for a while, but it sort of has become fragmented and there hasn't been a real clear vision in the past few years about um, how we're going to promote that from grade to grade. Um, the best presentation we saw happened to be within the own, within our own presentation, not from us, <laughs> um, but um, by the director of research in the, at the International Reading Association, Terry Salinger, she gave a, a, just a wonderful presentation of portfolios and a research study she did with some um, with the school district in New Jersey, and there were like about 12 components of the portfolio. Uh, and a key piece, though, was the reflective process of it and that for portfolios to be effective, teachers need time to go through them and reflect and use them to, as indicators for, to look for patterns of development in the child and to see just where is instruction going to be driven from, from, the, from the portfolios and also to have a, a streamlined uh, process from, from grade level to grade level. This particular study that she did in New Jersey was kindergarten through grade two, but she said it was real important to take it through the middle school. Um, but also throughout the convention, when we kept hearing about portfolios and, and their effectiveness, was to be careful that they weren't just a folder for artifacts, which I think sometimes can happen when you know, you're not given enough time or you're not given a real clear focus about what they should contain. So you, you pull a sample of a child's work and then it, it sits there. And, and what good is it if you're not going to use it to reflect on it to see what is the significance of it. Um, another piece, another assessment that we saw out there was a new in, informal reading inventory, which Pond Cove's been using for quite some time um, the old Burns and Rowe that we're so tired of, <laughs> um, just because it's so old. Um, but it's a it's a quicker form of assessment, and, and it's actually better at this point for grades two and up. But um, that is just having a child read a passage, and you're asking them comprehension questions. You're scoring them on their word recognition, and then you're scoring them on their comprehension. You're looking to see if there's a gap. We have real problems with the current one we're using because it doesn't have pictures. It doesn't really allow for us to see the strategies that we're really working on in kindergarten and first grade. We did see a new one out there um, that called the Classroom Reading Inventory by uh, Nicholas Silveroli. And Nancy St. John was familiar with him. He's been doing them for years. But this is a brand new edition. And um, we saw it. It has pictures. It also has new formats for to access comprehension. It has a a prediction format so the child can actually predict what it may be about just by referring to the picture. Then it has a retelling format. And retelling was real key, we found, from throughout the whole week as far as accessing comprehension. How well does the child summarize about the story? And uh, another presentation we saw by Yetta Goodman, who said, 
all comprehension work really shouldn't be done until the child has had the opportunity to retell the story in his own words. And that segued into another session that we saw on reading response activities on when the child's responding to a story, you're looking, and, and again, this, is, this goes into some of the Vygotsky work, is the child responding just on a literal level? Is he only telling you the facts from the story as he saw it? Is he inferencing? Is he, you might use Bloom's taxonomy information. Is, is he synthesizing ideas? Can, can he probe beyond on the, you know, is he inferencing? Um, so there, all the assessments, many of them interrelated, and we could see the significance on, on, for certain children that it may be good for, um, which grade levels it may be pertinent to. What we, what we recommended is that Pankov streamline assessments so that it become more consistent so that, you know, grade one isn't doing one format, then the child goes to second grade and it's a, it's a brand new type of assessment um, so that we can, if we do, you know, really do, do some work in revising our portfolio system, it will be connected and then you will be able to see patterns of development because you're using the same types of assessment. They may be higher level as they go along, but they, they're all connected and they're going to work. Um, another form of assessment we saw was a presentation by Yetta Goodman who did, uh, it's called retrospective miscue analysis, which it, it was an interesting assessment. It, I think it could be quite time consuming, but I think it had good implications for instruction. It told, it, it showed um, children listening, children reading for the teacher and actually the reading was actually audio tape. Then the, the teacher would listen to the audio tape and identify the miscues, the mistakes that the child made, and then have the child listen to it. And the child and the teacher interact and talk about these errors. Was was that a, in in how they were corrected? Was that a good thing for readers to do? What what might be a better strategy for you to use the next time you got to a word like that? Um, so there were, and we, we did present this to the staff and different grade levels expressed interest in different areas and um, this first grade summer curriculum work, we did a lot of work with it there and the IRI, the informal reading inventory I talked about earlier, Nancy Rollis has already requested that be sent, not the whole pet, you know, just the sample packet to see if that was something that we would we would like, and I know all the teachers in second, third, and fourth grade are very interested in it, and first grade was for our higher level readers. Um, so there was, I, I think we're on the right track as far as accessing this information and getting it. It's just a question of um, sitting down with teachers and looking through and deciding what, what we want. But we, it was a wonderful opportunity to really look at what was current, what was updated out there. Um, Standardized tests, uh, they, they, it was a real downplay on them um, throughout the convention, right from the beginning, from the keynote speaker, <laughs> Jonathan Kozel. Um, they, they really emphasized that they felt that standardized testing was very highly inappropriate for young children and should be used at the earliest at the fourth grade level. I did attend a session from a professor from Ryder University in New Jersey, of Phyllis Fontazzo, who looked at standardized tests and how you could use them to identify strategies readers <coughs> use and, and uh, looking at effective test taking strategies. And what, what I got out of this session was that she recommended that if you have standardized tests and you have, say you have three in your class that are, have questionable scores, that the teacher have the reading specialist or administrator contact the testing service and have these the actual tests sent to the school so that you can analyze the test and are not just looking at the score, but and to look to see what was what was the child's process in arriving at these answers, and that can give you information. Even though the child may have had a low test score, they may have actually been using some keen problem-solving strategies that you wouldn't know of because you just have the scores. So there is, and I have probably like copious pages of like 10 pages of notes that actually would be, are good for instruction too so you can access information. So um, it was phenomenal. And we just got so much information on assessment and, and feel like we've got some good places to start to, to revamp things. So, um, and as I said earlier, Connie and Tom and 
Nancy have the outline of, of the information. And we are requesting some um, more information be sent. There was one other area that I didn't mention. It was retelling format that I mentioned earlier with the IRI, but it also in our presentation was Elizabeth Salsby, who was a noted researcher in emergent literacy from the University of Michigan. And she did a presentation on retelling as a strategy. It was more for the first, uh, actually kindergarten and first grade level. Um, and I'm contacting her so she can send more information about that. But it was real good stuff. And um, we, we found it to be real beneficial and think, think it will help our, our process. Terrific. It sounds like you had a concentrated seminar. Yes, really, really um, We did list. I was interested in your recommendations, and um, a lot of them seem to be more systemic. I know your focus is elementary, but actually a lot of them are, are more systemic, such as a portfolio system, mm -hmm. um, the assessment tools from grade, you know, the consistency from grade mm -hmm. to grade, and um, the growing technology um, element to both acquiring and accessing information. Um, some of these things we're already starting to work on. Like we do, we do have access to the internet. It's through the middle school media center. But uh, as we come online with our with our, our computer technology program, that is part of um, the whole system is to become networked and and have access to outside information. Um, and the other thing in the planning for the renovated buildings, there is going to be a space for teachers to go where they will have periodicals and, and books, which is part of the media center. Mm. So it's, it's interesting, your recommendations are all things that, that are in process and are, do have board focus. There, there were some other areas that we, um, other workshops that we went to during that time. I don't know if there's time on this agenda to listen to them or, or whether you need to move on. Well, I, I was going to ask, um, you, had, you had down phonics and spelling, and if you did something on that, I'd like to hear if you did something about the actual teaching of reading. Assessment is very important, and as Charlie said, we are working on it. We need to continue to work on it. But in terms of um, what people are thinking about the actual teaching or reading, if you've heard from people on that. Um, the phonics we, um, was, was huge as well. We, probably the best presentation um, that we saw in phonics was by a, a professor of education at Stanford University, Robert Coffey. And it's interesting you ask about that because we've also contacted Stanford University to send us more information about that. They have a new program that they're piloting called Metaphonics <laughs> um, WordWorks. And of all the phonics programs I've seen as a first grade teacher, this was to me the most comprehensive. And to me, I guess I was more convinced. I've been try actually I did. I have tried some parts of it. I mean, I don't have all the information, but I did try some parts of it when I returned, um, tricked them all into thinking they were doing California word work, you know, so they were very motivated to do that, <laughs> what the kids in California were doing. Um, but um, it, it's a whole program, a, a very integrative program, very kinesthetic, um, involving phonics really as a separate piece. It, he emphasized that you would do it, you would teach it like four days a week, 30 minute sessions, um, small groups of children, um, and very, very integrated, very hands on. There's a whole program, there's actually a teacher's training program for it at Stanford. So I believe it's a two week training program. Um, we're getting information on it. Um, and then he said, beyond that, then you would spend the rest of your day working, you know, on, he said, reading and writing. Um, what I was impressed with about it as well, not just by his presentation, but there were teachers in California actually present who had piloted it and said that it was the most effective phonics program that they had ever worked with. So not only did we hear a professor, you know, who was obviously trying to sell his program, but there were teachers present that had said that it had been effective, and, and they were describing their, their classes, um, which were many of them low socioeconomic, um, 
multilingual um, classes that you know would be more at high risk anyway. And they said that even at, even in, in those cases, they it was highly effective. So. That's something, and at, at the first grade curriculum, Mark the first grade was very interested in that. Um, so we're having that sent um, uh, to us. One of the, the things that I liked about that, the program, or to look into it more, was because it did, it did go off in the older grades. Um, it wasn't strictly a phonics program that once the kids had their basis, it was over. In the third and fourth grade level, they, um, they worked on word origins, uh, taking, or also working on base words and prefixes and suffixes and really building and maybe taking a base word a week and then growing from there. How many other words can we form from this? Or taking a prefix and understanding what it means rather than um, you know, saying we've got this test coming up and there are, you know, there's going to be a section mm -hmm. on prefixes. Let's go run through a bunch of prefixes. They have a much, thorough, much more thorough understanding of, of why we use prefixes, how they're used. Um, and it could be part of the spelling program. It didn't have to be. It was a spiral program right. through in it which they found to be very effective and it, it looked it looked looked outstanding so um, but all all we have at this point are notes that we took but um, we've been we've contacted them and they're sending so can I can I just ask it might be a stupid question but in what way is teaching phonics kinesthetic? I mean how what did you mean by that? Um, well one of the techniques was uh, <laughs> they had um, what were called glue letters that they termed them, and I don't really understand what, because he didn't have the materials present. But say, say you're teaching CBC words, constant vowel, constant words, and you actually have the children wear, wear the letters. Um, it's not like, because when he first did this, I thought, oh no, it's like the alpha program, the letter people. It wasn't like that at all. <laughs> um, but the children actually generate the words. And then they actually make the words. They stand up, they and, move stand up and they move and around. And they're, the letters. Yeah, they're interchanging. And then you would then um, transfer it to, uh, like, say, little wooden tiles where all the consonants would be in blue, all the vowels are in red. And then they're, again, manipulating that, um, you know, transferring what they had done with the, with the glue layers. It's much more comprehensive, but um, that's an example of how it would be kinesthetic. It's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I have just one one more question. Um, obviously, we've uh, we've had issues in this town and every probably every town in the United States at this point, where there are going to be people in the community if they're actually watching tonight, which is doubtful, <laughs> summer night. But um, who are going to say, here we are talking again about you know this new theory and that new theory and, and that new theory. Okay. Um, I think it's really, really important that we, you know, go out and, you know, know what's going on in the world and, and try to bring these ideas in. But um, I hope, you know, I know it's this, this is, uh, you know, it's easy to get enthusiastic about all, all these new approaches. But I would just hope we would kind of go slow and inclusively with um, with parents um, to make sure that, you know, we don't lose sight of the, you know, the the unglitzy part, and and that is just that the kids learn to read, write it when they're supposed to. Well, one of the nice things about phonics is it really doesn't change that much. It oh, that's itself true. is the same. <laughs> true. Um, and, and Professor Coffey was, was saying, this is just a limited part of, of your reading program. It, you know, the kids are still immersed in literature. They're still being read to. This is the piece, the directed instruction piece, where those children who aren't picking it up on their own have that opportunity to hear how how letters are don't, don't don't get me wrong. I like phonics, no, I, and I would like to see us do more phonics. But I don't just want in terms of all these, I just mean yeah. in in terms of all these things we're looking at. And the other thing I think we need to uh, be aware of, as you said, a lot of these things take time. Um, I think we need to have very um, it, deep discussions um, mm -hmm. among among all parties about. You know, if, if certain things take time, they may very well be very worth doing, and, but we may have to do those instead of something else. And I think we've gotten to the point where there's only so much time in a, in a day, and I certainly would say that uh, teaching kids to read in early elementary school is the key goal, and if we need more time to actually, you know, get that job done, we have to be able to look at what we won't be able to be doing, but so. Well, like I said, we didn't do it well, so we don't yeah. want to do it. You know, like I mentioned that I had done a little bit of it in my classroom. It was by no means, I mean, it was really an experiment on my part to see how, how right. they would, right. you know, respond to it. Um, but it's, 
it, it's something that would involve teacher training. And, and all of these pieces really are auxiliary pieces. I mean, I think a lot of what we do, we did discover a lot of what we do, um, a great deal of what we do is, is right on key. I mean, the, you know, one of the presenters that I saw was <coughs> Leanna Trail, who is a researcher in New Zealand, and she did a two and a half hour presentation on this book she has that the first grade uses. So I was sitting there knowing <laughs> the whole piece of what she was doing, but at the same time, it wasn't, it wasn't a waste of time for me because it was just validating of what we do. And part of that was portfolio of pieces that she did, but it was, um, it, was, it was excellent. The same was true of the theme immersion workshops that I went to. CAPE is pretty, pretty knowledgeable about how to use themes in classrooms. And another piece that was um, satisfying to me was to go to a workshop and have people talk to me about things that I just heard about from Jim Curry, having gone to his mm -hmm. course and thinking, okay, you know, this is on target. And, you know, we're starting to pick away at those things. Maybe we need to have a more comprehensive view of how we're all going to do this, but at least we're moving in the right direction. Other comments? I just, obviously, from your um, discussion of this, it really was a very valuable um, conference, and you obviously took a lot back. and. I'm sorry you won't be here, Kelly, to share a lot more during the year, but Lisa, we're counting on you to, to continue and keep sharing with all the teachers everything you learned. And Kelly, when you come back, you'll share even more. Um, Try and, full of new ideas. Yeah. And um, I would, the phonics and spelling, I think, would be really interesting to look at for Pond Cove. Yeah, they're so very valuable. Yeah. Well, thank you both very much. It's, um, I understand, Kelly, you will be in touch. I guess having talked to Kelly, she is going to be sort of a liaison between us and her studies at Harvard, and we'll certainly be anxious to hear about them. And Lisa, since you're a graduate of the same institution, you can go back and forth. And um, I think there's a lot of uh, very real meat in what you presented tonight, as well as what uh, I'm sure all the things that aren't said, and we appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thanks again. And moving on, we have update on construction project. Um, today, for the first time in probably a couple of weeks, I actually drove up from a meeting had been uh, out of town up Scott Dyer Road. And uh, I think maybe it, they were in the process of taking those blue panels off the building the last time I drove up there. Uh, they're all gone and replaced. And it's astonishing to me what a difference that makes. The building finally has to come up, Scott Dyer. You can kind of see what the outline is. And now all we have to do, of course, is get in it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sue, you want to update us? Uh, we do have, you do have in your packet um, last week's sort of flash from the construction project update. And that is something you've had, so you've had a chance to look at it. So you might want to summarize any particular points here and add anything that you think is important. Well, as we expect, it is coming down right to the wire. Um, Pond Cove is done, uh, cleaned and, and really ready to open school with the exception of the media center. And that's ready, but we don't have the casework. Uh, we did move all of the contents of the media center to that location today so that we could free up the classroom that it was in. So the books are there, but unfortunately the shelving isn't. Um, but other than that, Pond Cove is, is set to go. Uh, the middle school, on the other hand, is getting there. Um, we had Area E, which is going to be the fifth grade wing, uh, turned over to us today to begin cleaning. We have cleaned all of those classrooms um, and we're having to do everything from windows to sinks to walls that still need cleaning to stripping ceiling and doing three coats of wax on the floor. So it's an enormous task once they turn things over to us for us actually to be ready to move in. Um, our hope is for this Friday to move in the contents of the fifth grade classrooms. And so that area will be done um, with the exception of some things that need to be done to the hallways. Um, the lockers arrived today, and I understand it's about a two-day assembly. 
So they'll start piecing them together in the hallways so that they will be there also. Um, tomorrow we're going to get the art room and June 30th has finally come. That was the date we were promised to have the middle school art room and in fact we're going to get it on August 22nd but that will be cleaned so that we can move that stuff out of the hallway and into the, the middle school art room. Um, we're also going to start cleaning area G and that's the link, that's the seventh and eighth grade wing and um, our plans right now is to have that completed, at least complete the cleaning by Tuesday of next week and move the seventh and eighth grade in on Tuesday and Wednesday. We have um, solicited some assistance from Gary's Trucking um, to do it. I, I did a walkthrough over the weekend and started figuring out how many rooms we had to move in and how much square footage there was to clean and given our staff there was no way. So we have gotten some outside help and I think that we will meet those deadlines. Um, I met with Peter and Jim today and I think we're going to be able to start cleaning F classrooms, which is the IT wing, and the 1930s classrooms um, on Monday. And our hope is to be done with those so that on Wednesday the moving crew can also move into those classrooms. So that's the plan um, for the interior of the building. The exterior of the building um, looks great, as Connie said, um, as you approach it from the southern side of Cape Elizabeth, it, it looks like a real campus when you look over the high school and then look up to um, the Pond Cove Middle School facility. They've cut the grass. Um, all of the final paving is going to be done on Saturday, and that's Saturday, August 26th. And we ask that teachers, staff, community members stay off of that entire campus so that they can do the final paving and the striping so that come Monday, those areas will be available for parking, uh, for staff, and so forth. Um, this, there's still more seating to be done, and that will be done next week also. So when people return, there will be areas that you need to stay off of in order for the grass to come up. And that also includes seating the area that um, house the portables, so behind Pond Cove. So that area will be cleaned up. Uh, I also included in your packet um, a map that will be available to community people if there's any confusion as to how they're to access the Pond Cove Middle School facility. Included in the map is, is the staff parking areas, the visitor parking, um, the actual parent drop-off loop that will accommodate both Pond Cove and Middle School parents. And um, we've separated the parking area and the parent drop-off area so that that congestion that we experienced last year hopefully will not occur. So parents will come in, circle around the drop-off area and continue out. Bob Malley and I will be um, walking the area tomorrow and talking about appropriate signage to help with the efficiency of moving traffic, no stopping, no parking. Um, we'll have some police assistance the first few days of school to get people sort of um, accustomed to where they're supposed to be and where they're not supposed to be. Um, the, what was the Pond Cove bus loop will now be both the middle school and the Pond Cove bus loop and that connecting road going from the high school to Pond Cove continues to be for buses only. And that's something that we're going to try to monitor. Um, much more carefully than in the past. We're going to also have some police assistance, but for safety of students, buses and traffic will not be mixed. Uh, Jordan Way continues not to be a parent drop-off area, so people that um, need to be on Jordan Way or should only be there for public safety and public works business. Um, the access road, which enters from Scott Dyer Road, also has a sidewalk for walkers, and that sidewalk now continues all the way across the parking lot so that students coming from um, the Farm Hill neighborhood don't have to intermingle with, with car traffic. There is a sidewalk that goes all the way along now, so that for safety reasons, um, that's how they should enter the complex. 
If you look um, also on your map, you'll notice that there is a staff parking area here um, off of Scott Dyer Road. That accommodates only a few cars. There are also some walkways that will come down in between the Pond Cove School and the Middle School, and that will be how Scott Dyer and Brentwood students will enter the campus. However, I don't believe that's going to be ready for the first day of school. So those students will need to cross um, by the old middle school driveway and then walk down and come in the walkway, the main walkway, <coughs> which is a little bit longer walk, but for their safety for the first, probably just the first few days of school, they'll have to come that way. And then after that time, they will be able to access both the middle school and Pond Cove from directly across Hillway. Areas that won't be ready for day one, um, the gymnasium will be undergoing uh, structural work. The locker rooms will be incomplete, but they will be usable for um, athletic, the athletic program after school. Um, there will be st still the contractor around. They'll be doing lots of work on the outside of the building. So um, the front yard of the 1930s building will be off limit and well fenced so that people will be um, sure what is off limits and, and what is okay to access. So there should be good signage and good fences out there to separate what is construction area and what is now accessible areas. Any questions? Yes, Beth. I have a couple. Um, are we going to have two crossing guards again this year, one at the new entry road and one um, by that's, I guess, where the new uh, sidewalk will go in by the staff parking? Yes. 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 And where should kids on bikes um, ride in, and where will the bike racks be? We haven't placed them yet, but I assume um, at the middle school, they'll be out, they'll come in the access road, and usually Mr. Jewett and I take a little walk around and place those. Right now, they are out by that parking lot close to the athletic fields. Sort of where they um, were last year? I think that's where they ended up at the end of the year. So that's where they are. And I'm not sure where the Pond Cove ones are. They're usually on the playground side. They, they were sort of by the breezeway for a while. They right. were bike rack. I don't know if that's... And I think they're still there at this moment. But that's something probably that we will need to check out next week. Um, have you spoke about the media center at Pond Cove Furniture not having arrived? Has the other furniture arrived? The only furniture that has arrived is um, the seventh and eighth grade science furniture. That's all we have. We don't have the cafetorium furniture yet either. And that was supposedly shipped on August 7th. The um, Pond Cove Media Center was shipped on August 18th. Um, Ellen's on vacation. and. Um, they're trying to track exactly where some of these pieces are. But so far, that's all we've received is the science furniture. Huh. And that would be, there's new furniture for the art room at Pond Cove and the science room. And so those are just empty now. Exactly. Yes. I think that was the end of my questions. Other questions? Will the playgrounds be usable? Yes, they will be. Else? Thank you, Sue, for all your hard work. I know you're yeah. very busy now <laughs> getting all these spaces ready. Well, it's sort of, um, when we get all through with this, we really should have a, some kind of a fireworks display or something to say, thank goodness. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, it is, it's just, a, remember a year ago, though, it does seem like we're making progress. Obviously, we are. And um, I do hope, sincerely, that this is a, year that people can begin to enjoy the fruits of a lot of hard work because this is uh, clearly such, we, we discovered so many things that were so bad about our old situation that um, it's been impossible to share all that information directly with the community. But in some way this year as we celebrate this, which is a community um, event obviously, we probably ought to try to recreate some of those things just to tell people how needed it was. And then the other piece 
that we want to make public are the plans that we have uh, already started but will be finalized during the year uh, for preventive and regular maintenance. Uh, we want to make sure that the community understands that we do take seriously this whole task of caring for those buildings and appreciating um, the educational opportunities that they will facilitate. So we'll keep you up to date on that. We also want, again, if anybody is watching this, to let the public know that we will have plenty of opportunities for you to see the building, to take a tour. Um, we certainly want to share this with a lot of people. Uh, right now, we would appreciate, obviously, that you not take an unprecedented, I mean, an unscheduled tour. But please wait until we can get some of those tiles down, washed, and so on and so forth. But we will be inviting people in and make plenty of um, advertisements available so the community can come, including people who haven't been in the school for years, particularly those people. So. Honey, did you want to mention some of the things that have happened at the high school that wasn't part of this report? But right. I think it's important, too, to note that part of our budget this year, actually we started last year, was a five-year maintenance rehab on the high school. And um, there's been a lot of work going on, some of which is obvious from the outside. If you've gone uh, around the building, you can see um, some work being done on the concrete. Uh, we're pretty well moving along now, finishing up the window replacement program that we started last year, uh, something that the public, I think, will deeply appreciate is the replacement of the outside lights. I don't think that's been accomplished yet, but all the ordering and so on and so forth is in place in that. Again, uh, we hope by the time the, the uh, 4 o'clock darkness comes that that will, in fact, be absolutely done. But at least it's all in place and, you know, working towards that. Um, probably the most obvious thing people will see when they return to the high school outside of some um, facelifting kinds of things which are part of the preventive um, and ongoing maintenance is the enlargement of the library to include a computer center. Um, although it will be largely done by the start of school, we are in a situation where our lease, computer lease program will not have all the computers there for the opening day of school, but they will be coming within a few weeks and the computers we've had, will, some will be there and some will be still upstairs for a math and science room. So we feel strongly that we are accomplishing uh, moving on that goal too, which is the rehabilitation, renovation of the high school building. Anything you want to add, to either Sue or yes? Oh yes, thank you. Yes, that doesn't show up, but it sure does show up in the budget. So we have a we have a little certificate from the DEP that says we're all set on that one. Anything else? No. Okay. Moving on, um, you have a report in your packet, Gail Schmader, on the school volunteer services. I thought it was um, really complete and very readable summary. Um, and you also received a copy of the um, the little booklet that she has put together, which I thought was particularly attractive. That is handed out to volunteers. Um, Gail is, is extremely visually oriented. Everything she does looks nice, if you've noticed any of her presentations. Um, this is a, a program that uh, has, in many respects, volunteers, of course, have been used by the system for uh, many years. Um, but under Gail's leadership, this has been much more systematized. It is notable that we have far more volunteers in Pond Cove than we do in our other two buildings, but that is certainly the experience of many school systems. Um, you might, I know every year we kind of wonder why that is. We all have some ideas, but it's not because um, there are probably multiple reasons for that. Uh, I think the graphs that she's included to show you the hours, I think her attempt to give you a dollar figure for what these uh, many hours of service, at, and I suspect that her estimate is probably a conservative one, but at 41,000, uh, that's a significant contribution that people are making to our schools. That's uh, a teacher at least, it might even if we were talking about two beginning teachers, be almost two teachers. Uh, all of which is time that enriches our programs and also connects us uh, more strongly with our community and we're extremely grateful. Questions or comments? I'd like to make a comment. 
that I think, and I know this is an, I, I feel this is an excellent report, and I don't think it truly reflects the number of people that have volunteered. Um, she tabulated it from the sign-in sheet and from the responses on sending back the tally, year tally. And I know for the people in Parent Forum, a lot of them put in an awful lot of hours in the high school and um, don't feel they need to or haven't gotten credit. around to <laughs> handing in the tally sheet. So I think the high school has more volunteers than, than um, is indicated here. I think we've noticed that in the past that that no doubt is true. There are people doing things that either for whatever reason, forget. Um, so this is a conservative report. Mm -hmm. What the real picture is, no doubt, richer than this. Anne? Um, just a couple, couple comments. Um, she, she's noting in her goals um, the idea of having more volunteer projects and such. And, and um, I think uh, we need to work closely with her and the administrators as we try to develop that you know, kind of vision for volunteer activities, K-12. K but I think, I, I, for instance, I, I didn't know about the, uh, the United Way Yes board. And I think um, you know, we, need to, we need to all work together to just you know, have a complete picture of what we're doing. Yeah. Um, also, I'm just, I'm just um, wondering, through, throughout her um, description, there, she talks about awareness sessions. Is she really talking about education sessions of some kind? Educa training uh, sessions for volunteers. Tra actual training sessions. Yeah. She, I know at Pond Cove, at September, October, there's like a morning meeting or a morning and an evening meeting where she does a little um, training session. On how to be a volunteer or? And, and you know, sort of goes over, you know, the confidentiality the and those kind mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if that's exactly what she means, right. but um, that certainly happens at Pond Cove. Because I think, the, um, you know, one thing um, that we really need is a little, a little more education of staff of ways to use volunteers. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just in my experience, you know, there, there have been times I've been begging to be used <laughs> as a volunteer and, um, you know, sometimes teachers seem to be a little bit at, at a loss as to how to utilize volunteers. Um, so I think that that should really be a focus. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Carla? I was just going to say that I, I went to the awareness one at Pine Cove last year and it was, it was not for staff on how to right. use them. It was right. for the parent volunteers and it was mostly things like confidentiality and universal precautions and behavior issues, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. But it was very poorly attended. It's one well, of our goals to, to try to, and increase well, that. But. To be perfectly honest, I think a lot of people are doing a lot of volunteering, probably feel they one more meeting. That, that they don't need to attend that meeting, especially if the, now that this handbook is coming out. I'm not sure it isn't redundant to ask someone to to attend that meeting. Right. So I do think the confidentiality issue is extremely important. Uh, that people understand that, and we have some recognition from them that they've read that and are taking it to heart. But one of the reasons that Gail has taken that step to offer the um, awareness sessions is that um, when people are volunteering in the schools, they are covered by our insurance. It is a, a question that regularly comes up. If I'm working in the schools, and some, you know, God forbid, but something happens, right. um, am I covered by school insurance? And the answer is yes. Uh, Any time that we are dealing with um, people that, that we ask to do something, it is wise for us to have procedures that include clearly going over some of the things that we think are baseline. And, and she and I have had some discussions about that in the past, and I certainly do uh, think it's a wise use of time. And I would encourage people to make that effort because not everything is covered in the handbook, or you need to ask a question or clarify something or um, and we are also, um, as you say, the precautions issues and, you know, nosebleeds, what have you, there are things that come up that people, we think they might know, but they don't. And if something happens and we haven't told people, then we have a problem. So that's one of the reasons why that is. It may be occasionally redundant, but we are trying to earn the sense of being helpful. Well, then do we, is it important enough we need to make it mandatory if somebody's going to volunteer? I mean, because if we have 35 yeah. people attend and we have 250 volunteers, we're not covering ourselves very well. We haven't yet, in any of our discussions about insurance, come to the conclusion that that is so important that we can't let people in the door unless they've done it. That would seem to be counterproductive. 
but we are certainly willing to continue to make that available to people. I'd just like to stress Anne's point, too, that um, really working with teachers for lots of different ways to use volunteers is very important. Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot that we can do. Anyway, thank you, Gail. And if you're watching, um, I love the seeds. The, um, anybody who has either been a volunteer or is aware of that, uh, for the last couple of years, she's been handing out seeds, which I think is both a nice thing to do, but also, uh, from a metaphorical point of view, wonderful. So, thank you. I also want to applaud using the student artwork throughout this. Yes. I thought this was very nicely done. Okay, moving on. Um, I'm not going to spend any amount of time going over the school board administrator's August workshop, to, except to note that we have done that. A number of issues came up. Um, all of them pretty much reflected in one way or the other to your, your regular goal setting process. And I think uh, just to share a general impression discussing this with, uh, with the principals um, the following day after you met with us, uh, we realized we're sort of finishing up a five-year program and laying uh, the specific groundwork for the upcoming five-year program. It doesn't work quite that neatly. There are many, many overlaps, of course. But um, it is useful to both look back as well as look forward. And part of what our process was was to try to do that. The other was to be clear about priorities and um, those kinds of things that will guide our work. Um, I did bring up as part of our workshop the fact that I am um, going to have to make some adjustments to accommodate a state mandate. I kind of think it's an unfunded mandate. but. And we'll try to do it so that it doesn't cost um, anything in particular. But it's going to cost time. And that's the IASA, the Improving America's Schools Act um, planning process. And we did just kind of continue discussing that as an administrative staff. And we'll get back to you with some specifics on that. Any other comment or thought? OK, moving on. Opening day of school. Um, We've already talked, of course, a little bit about that from the standpoint of construction. And uh, it's with a great deal of relief I'm able to say, yes, we can open school on time. Any rumors to the contrary notwithstanding. Um, we are going to have our faculty <coughs> opening day in the new facility. I trust it will be something to sit on. Uh, <laughs> We will somehow solve that problem like all the other problems we've solved. Um, anyway, we're going to have it there, <laughs> come what may, and uh, try to start the year off with a sense of celebration. Some yet. of the new furniture is wood chairs. Oh, good. <laughs> so we have chairs. We do have chairs. Oh, good. And it is carpeted. Mm -hmm. right. Sort of that carpet, so it wouldn't be that uncomfortable. Oh yes, it is. no, that's all done. The, the, the shell is all there. We just need something to sit on. Uh, okay. We might have a first grade reading session on the floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, seriously, we are looking forward to this with a great deal of enthusiasm. Um, as we ha we have a couple of items uh, on the agenda later, one in particular request for leave of absence that impacts the opening day of school, not the, not the sense that we would be able to open, but just some of these things that happen. As we get ready to open, we look at such issues as teacher, uh, do we have any last minute resignations and how is our staffing pattern and so forth. Um, and I thought it best to mention um, because I think there is some discussion about it. Uh, we've been keeping an eye on class enrollments. Uh, we're a district that, that doesn't have a, um, a lot of building going on. I'm looking for my, oh, yeah, here we are. Um, so we are not a, a district that tends to open the doors and wonder if we've got 50 new kids standing there. There isn't anything in the housing pattern to lead us to believe that that's going to happen. So pretty much what we end up in June is what we wind up in September. But there has been a question raised because about first grade because, in fact, when we were doing our budget work last spring, as you recall, um, we had uh, first grade enrollments then that were at the 20 and 21 uh, class size. There was a good deal of discussion uh, during the budget process, just to remind you, 
about how many sections were needed by first grade and how many sections were needed by second grade. And ultimately, the decision was made to add a section to the second grade, the largest class at Pond Cove, and a class with some particular um, issues. And the, um, the other enrollments were reviewed, and it was decided to leave them at the sections that they had. Um, at the, in June, I, and I would refer you to the sheet that, um, that I just handed at you before we started. Enrollment comparison on August 22nd, if you have that sheet. Uh, by the end of June, this June, 95, these were the numbers that had already been placed. 134 in kindergarten, and as of 822, or as of today, that's at 132. So we kind of, somewhere along the way, we appear to have lost two kindergartners, but that clearly is a pretty much what we left, in, or the teachers left in June, knowing that they would have. Grade one had 125 placed in June, and at right now we have 130. So that five additional students have appeared for the six first grade, first grade sections. That has resulted in the sections being mostly 22 with one of 21. Grade two um, has gone from 162 to 166. Uh, and grade three from 120 to 121, grade four from 128 to 131, grade four uh, resulting in the largest uh, class size, but of course they are the oldest children, and that is certainly not, still not at the state maximum size of 25. Um, looking at the data at the bottom of that sheet, um, because this is one of those things that sometimes gets to be anecdotal evidence. People say, gee, we've had a lot of people coming in um, we have a lot of entrances. Um, notice at the first grade level, there have been 14 youngsters signed up, but we've also uh, seen eight departures. Um, and I realize that that's eight from 14 to six, not five, but the reason it's 125 and 130 up above in your data sheet is that one child had been placed as of the end of June. So we're still only seeing an increase in five as to what we knew we had in June. Um, there is nothing remarkable about these changes. Um, the only thing that has been raised is whether or not the idea of having classes as large as 20 or 21 at the first grade is somehow higher than it should be. Uh, well, if you look at your class size policy, which I also included in your packet, just to refresh your memory, we do have recommended sizes, but we also have a clear statement here that the thing that triggers additional um, or the consideration of additional staff is uh, if any elementary or secondary school class exceeds the state maximum size, uh, that's 25 at elementary. Um, so I think, I know that there, it's come to my attention that there is some concern about this issue, um, but I do know that you reviewed it thoroughly through the budget process and it hasn't changed dramatically, but I thought in all fairness I should call it to your attention and have you uh, Take another look at it if you want to, uh, um, or, or express your reaction to it in some way so that um, if anybody wants to say anything about it now, this is an opportunity. Charlie? Having walked through the building the other day and looking at the, the sizes of classrooms, um, but both the first and second grade classrooms are probably the smallest classrooms in the system. What I noticed with the first grade was the amount of movable space, meaning to be able to move around. And there wasn't a lot. But what I saw was a lot of stuff. I'm sure it's important stuff, but I'm sure it's not stuff that we use every day. And I think we as a system, and especially the elementary, need to find some place that we can store stuff that's accessible. Because I think, I think some of those rooms need to be cleaned out. I think, I think stuff needs to be stored somewhere other than the classroom. I know they are short, short on casework, and hopefully, if our if our contingency holds out in the in the building committee, we will be able to provide additional casework. But I think that is something that the that the administrative staff has to get on to the, the staff about getting some of, of that stuff out of the room to create more space. And that's just that's that's a layman's observation. Mm -hmm. When when teachers talk about first graders that need to move around. Well, you need to get 
the obstacles out of their way so they can move around. Other comments? Anne? Uh, well, we did discuss this, and I think we were we during the budget process, and, and um, I, I would certainly be looking for a lot bigger bulge than um, five kids um, to reevaluate this because, first of all, we don't have any money to hire another teacher um, that's readily available, and moving a teacher from another grade will just cause a lot of turmoil for both the grades <laughs> since all these kids have already been placed in classrooms, know who their teachers are. I think uh, the impact of having one, one or two children more in the classroom is not worth that turmoil. Other comments? Keith? I, I tend to agree with, with Ann also. That, uh, just a few extra kids, I don't think we should upheave the whole process two weeks before uh, we start. Well, if you get questions or comments, um, and in a small community like this, it's not uncommon. Uh, I think this data sheet gives you certainly what, what we know today, and it gives it to you in a very clear, readable fashion. Um, and perhaps you can allay people's concerns, because I think I heard one rumor that the first grade was at 23 to 24. I have no idea what sparked that kind of concern, but at the same time, it could be something as simple as the fact that there were 14 signups um, without knowing that, that eight kids have left the system. So um, that would be important to try to um, urge people to understand what the real picture is, not what the room is. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and we're down to the new Pine Cove principal, speaking of Pine Cove proposed entry plan, and again, you have some material that you'll have to read thoroughly at your leisure because we just gave it to you, but uh, Tom is here to explain a little bit what that that is and give you the highlights of it. I'll just preface this by saying I'm delighted to have, uh, welcome Tom, I guess this is, this is practically your first board meeting, you've been at a couple of others, you were at the June one, but as the um, person who's now kind of handling some phone calls and issues and what have you. You're Including quickly. first grade enrollment, that's right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, the, the, pur the purpose of an entry plan is to, uh, it's twofold. One is to uh, give a person who's new to the system um, a structure or to, to create a structure by which uh, people's expectations of that new person can be um, reasonably handled because as soon as you walk in the door if you're a new principal everybody's got everything that they ever thought they wanted or needed you tend to be asked to solve problems that's what the way those things go uh, but you may in fact need some time to understand what the problem is before you can actually effectively solve it the other piece of course is that um, this is very helpful for us and as Tom goes down through this the new person coming in is a person who's coming in uh, seeing us and seeing the way the organization is operating uh, with a new perspective. And it's a fresh perspective. It's without any previous um, uh, experience or, or sometimes we, we use the term baggage. I mean, and, and as soon as you're really part of an organization, it's hard to get that fresh perspective. So we hope that this will give you an opportunity and be helpful to you, but we also, I believe firmly, that you will be helpful to us so we can see ourselves a little clearer. So perhaps you would like to explain to the board and to the audience in general how you see this process going. I, I should say after the discussion about spelling and phonics that I found some typos in this out there looking mm -hmm. at it, but it, you'll find them when you get down there. Um, uh, personally, what this means to me is that I have to learn a new system quickly. And going back to the interview process, the hiring process that brought me here, we talked about uh, what kind of agendas I would bring. Um, I think I mentioned at the time, I don't think it's a good idea to bring a, a predetermined agendas. So this uh, entry plan, and I rely heavily on, on Connie for that, um, for, for framing this question for me, gives me a chance to, to look at the system rather than the people and personalities. And uh, I do this with a, a great deal of respect for the work that's gone on before and for the people I've met over the summer. Um, part of this plan, uh, an integral part, is that I make my findings public 
That is, I come to you tonight and tell you what I'm going to do and give you uh, timelines for reporting back to you. And I think it's also uh, an opportunity for the community to learn more about its uh, school, particularly its new school. Um, I can take you down through. Um, basically, my plan would be uh, my selfish, personal, professional motive is to learn things quickly and a broader perspective we can learn together. Uh, I have a couple of devices that I've added to this um, at the back so you can see what I'm up to. One of them is a structured interview. Uh, the casual interviews I've had this summer, particularly with Wayne and Nancy, have been extremely helpful to me so I can get a grip on things. But I'd like to, um, I would like you, the board, to reserve time with me so that we can talk and I can take you through the interview that's at the uh, back of this little paper. Um, and the same thing, I'd like to do the same thing with uh, volunteer teachers. I hope that the team leaders would like to do this and uh, any other staff member can do that interview part. Uh, to make this discussion more public, um, I have some general questions I would like to use as a discussion generators to talk about Pond Cove and what we know about Pond Cove in terms of student results. Again, my self selfish motive is uh, to introduce the staff to some of the skills I think I have in uh, communication so you can learn about me and to help set uh, specific goals and objectives for this year. I'd also like to include as many parents as possible in this process and that means I'll be talking to the Pond Cove Parents Association about doing the same process I plan to do with the teachers with the uh, parents who come to the meeting that night. Um, you'll see in this report that um, I, I think the joke was when I was hired, if I plan to see all the classes all the time, I'll need uh, um, roller blades. But I, I am quite serious about, about using uh, supervision, uh, developmental supervision that I mentioned here to be a visible presence in the school, to see classes, to see teachers, to see what uh, grown-ups and kids are up to. And as one small gesture in that, I, I would make an offer to teachers that have I'll come in and sub for half an hour on a scheduled day if the teacher agrees to observe another lesson uh, or, or class at a different level, assuming you haven't taught that one in a while, so even at the middle school or high school. There are a lot of things going on in uh, Cape Elizabeth, uh, including the, the completion of the building renovation uh, project. So the timing for me is perfect. I like to schedule, uh, in addition to an open house, uh, I'm sure that you'd want to do this too, a celebration of the new building. And after that's completed, um, in conjunction with the other initiatives, the mission statement and uh, the state and national pressure to have uh, uh, system-wide planning and reports to schedule what we called in Vermont uh, a, a school report night. And the last time we did it, we made it into school report day, uh, school report day and night. I, I, I've been thinking about it. It's kind of like car talk, if you listen to that on the radio. Any question is fair game. We will develop... Uh, um, our own presentation, uh, people who help me with this entry plan and present it, but people usually have questions I've never thought of. So sometime later in this year, without uh, adding more meetings and more initiatives, just to have a, a focus on Pond Cove. Uh, one, one slight disclaimer, I, I do believe in a K through 12 system, that's one of the reasons I came to uh, Cape Elizabeth, but for this, this period, particularly my first few months, I just want to concentrate on Pond Cove and the Pond Cove community, but uh, I think in the future we can broaden that perspective. Questions, comments? Anne? I think your idea of taking classrooms and teaching and you know, having the teachers go off to another grade level or, is just an outstanding idea. It's great for you because you get to see what's going on in that classroom. It's a great opportunity for the teachers as well. It's a great idea. Good. And you're all willing to schedule an hour or so with me in the near future? Absolutely. Of course. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other questions, comments? Tom, I think we all look forward to reading this and, um, and, and speaking with you. And finding the typos. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think um, th this kind of approach really <clears throat> will be interesting to watch. And an entry lasts, kind of comes in phases, like the first phase is maybe the first three months, and then it kind of enters another phase. So it'll be interesting to see how you, you feel about that, too. 
That's it. For Next me. item on the agenda is school board subcommittees and reports. And Charlie, Finance Committee. Uh, we met this evening at 6.30 in the Town Hall Conference Room. Um, we signed the warrants. We reviewed the appropriations report. Um, we covered the awarding of the school lunch food bids, which actually covered the milk bid, the bread bid, and um, a line of foods that comes from Jordan's Foods. The milk bid went to the Oakhurst Dairy, and the bread bid went to La Page Bakeries. Um, we had some discussion about the school setting up the school lunch price, which we will do after the conclusion of this report. Um, we also reviewed the bus purchase bids that came in. We had two. Um, a bid from W.C. Cressy, which came in at $52,170, and a bid from Portland North that came in at $55,972, and we are going with the W.C. Cressy bid of $52,170. That meets all our specifications, plus state specifications. And essentially, that was our finance committee. Um, I would propose move that we increase the hot lunch price for the academic year 1995-96 from $1.35 to $1.50 for, for the hot lunch and that the milk price remain at 30 cents. Is there a second? Second. Charlie, did you want to add anything about the staff price or the adult okay. price? And the staff, I will amend that, that would increase, would also include the, the staff increase from um, to 250. Do we need a second on that amendment? Do we have it? Second. Priscilla, thank you. <laughs> Any discussion? All those, oh, Anne? I guess I'd just like to reiterate what I said, that I think it's important um, that if we change this, and with the information that goes out um, to parents about the program, that we describe the changes that have uh, come about in the hot lunch program this year and that we expect during this year. I think we should touch on this. Gail? I think we should touch on some of the um, reasons behind this. Uh, now. What I would do is ask the business manager to come forward and explain the, the new barcode uh, card system and also why the increase in pricing. Uh, I'll start with the first one. On the computer system, what we have is a new barcode system installed in the Pond Cove and the middle school, which will allow students to have lunch cards and also uh, sheets with their names on it at the point of service where you uh, record the meals. Um, we'll be able to quickly move students through the line, swipe across the barcode, and it'll record meals that are purchased and also deduct those uh, figures from individual accounts. So that's one of the items that we have in place now. Um, part, of the, uh, purpose, uh, part of the payment of that is obviously each year we have to update the cards, and uh, that's part of that factor of the increase of the meal cost. The other thing that we're doing in the lunch program this year is you're going to see a lot more choices on the student line. Um, we're looking at a choice of three entrees each day, uh, along with the uh, uh, other two components of the meal. So students will see more choices as they started to see at the end of last year. Um, so that's another reason for our increased price. Uh, we've also realized, uh, as we talked in our finance committee meeting, um, some increased operating costs for food costs and labor costs. Uh, so that's the rationale for our increased meal costs this year. It's also, if you look at the comparison of surrounding communities, that puts us at the same meal price as our uh, surrounding school systems. Uh, I have a question, Scott. Um, when you describe that um, the barcode mm -hmm. will be swiped and it will go to the child's account, yes. parents will be sent something and explained exactly how this works and if they can put money into this account ahead of time that it's deducted from, is that right? Yes, what we're, look what we're looking for is now parents can pay at any point in time through the course of the year. If they want to give us $100, they want to give us $10, we'll credit it to that student's account. And then we'll, as the student goes through the line, we'll deduct it from their account. And what we're hoping to do is each month send out uh, billing information to parents where they're at on their account. 
so there'll be a lot more input. Would, uh, would each child have their own account, or could families, if you have three children in the It's system? set up for each child, okay, is the way the system works. The other, um, uh, the other part of that, too, is we also have the ability, uh, if parents want their student, uh, the child eating on just the hot lunch line and not necessarily the a la carte line, we have the availability of blocking students from a la carte as well through that system. Okay. Is it ever possible to group children and a family into one account? Uh, I don't know. I'd have, to, I'd have to research that and find out. My, my first answer would be no, because each student is accounted for individually. Thanks. What, another question, Scott. This is not including the high school. This is, is not correct? including the high school. Uh, the high school is strictly an a la carte program, not part of the state of Maine or the federal uh, meal program. Uh, obviously, in the future, we could look at that, because uh, the computer system could be interfaced with the Pond Cove system, and it would operate very significantly to a McDonald's where you would have key codes on the pad and you could punch hamburger, milk, you know, sandwich, whatever, and immediately take the cost for that. So, so the capability of expansion of this software program uh, is significant. And we have not raised our lunch cost in the last two years. The past two years we haven't increased our uh, lunch program cost. Thank other, you. other questions or comments? All those in favor? 7-0. Charlie. I will, I will say there, there will be no increases in the a la carte Oops. prices at the high school. And uh, you're on again, Charlie. Yes, I know. Building, building. <laughs> OK, the school building committee met on August 3rd. Um, and um, several things were discussed. We're getting towards the end of the project. Uh, the balance on our project is pretty much just contingency, and, and very little of that is left. So essentially, we've, we've pretty much spent the whole project. Uh, we still have some flexibility in the movable equipment contingency. Um, we have budgeted and, and approved some of those movable equipment things. but. One of those is, that is on hold is the case where it is still a priority committee, <clears throat> as it is a priority of the board and the staff. Um, we will probably be looking more at making a decision probably in September on that particular item. Um, there still have risen some structural problems that have been uncovered in the middle school and a great deal of discussion and a great deal of expenditure is going into to making sure that those those facilities are 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 safe and have been corrected. Um, as Sue alluded to earlier, one of those areas that's it's taking a lot of time and a lot of money from the contingency is the middle school gym. But we will have a very safe, secure, and um, hurricane-proof <laughs> facility. Um, there were several items that were moved and um, approved. Um, one of the areas that, the, that we have to look at is the middle school 1930s building. And it has really to do with the parapets or those false chimney appearances on each end. And they are now called the leaning, the leaning parapets of Cape Elizabeth because they actually were built without any kind of support structure to hold them. And they are actually leaning into the building, which is better than if they were leaning away from the building. Um, we asked the architects to, to actually go out and, um, and bid this out as a separate, separate project. Um, this is something that has to be done, but can be done you know, at a later time. Uh, so we have some idea of the estimate, estimated cost, so we, we're kind of holding that amount in um, the contingency for that. Um, we will be meeting again on next week on August 31st, and we will be meeting in the cafetorium of the new Pond Cove Middle School at 7 p.m. Thank you, Charlie. Any questions or comments? Keith? Charlie. Uh or somebody from the building committee, could you just let us know we're on budget and obviously we're on schedule and 
is enough money in the contingency and that type of thing? Um, at present, we probably have about, I, I know the town council approved a, um, a reimbursement to the contingency concerning some sewer work that was done at their request, which is about $12,000. So that kind of put the construction contingency at about um, 70, 74,000. Uh, the movable equipment contingency has about 95,000, and there is an additional, there's another 30,000 of projects that, that the movable equipment subcommittee had kind of tentatively recommended. Um, one of that, one of those is, a couple of those are to do with um, lighting, stage lighting, and some upholstery pieces for common, um, gathering places that we felt were low priority items, things that could be actually added at a later time. So the architect firm feels that we're, we have enough to get us through the rest of the project to cover the other little two to 4,000 kind of change orders that might come along, that they have uncovered any possible major um, structural things. The major one I think that we have to deal with now is are those parapets and, and the um, actual uh, resurfacing of uh, the brick outer layer of that building. So we will have to do the parapets because they are leaning. And there's some flashing work that will be done even though we will not re-roof that building because it's relatively new roof but at some time will have to be re-roofed. We will do the flashing work at that time. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? It is exciting having walked through the other day. It just is exciting. Um, there was one minor glitch <laughs> <laughs> in this major multi-planning project, and that had to do with the science room sinks. Um, when the bid went out, the sinks were in for the whole project were bid out at a certain spec. Um, what we realized when they started to install these sinks, which were bought at the beginning of the project, was that the science, all the science sinks, which are eight per room, are actually um, handicap access depth, which is a five and a half inch depth. That would not be sufficient for science projects or science uh, or washing a glass or that kind of thing. It is something that the committee is aware of. We have set aside funds to, to once school has started, sometime going back and, and replacing the sinks that need to be replaced with deeper sinks. I should point out that the way in which that occurred, um, it was not possible for us to just at the last second replace, once this problem had been discovered, to replace sinks because there is an issue of credit. They had already been bought, they'd been taken out of the crate. Um, and so it sounds like we should just be able to take a few sinks back, but when you buy in bulk, it isn't that simple, so. Carla? So you're saying we're going to be able to eventually return those sinks? No, no we're going we will get a We will replace them. them. What's going to happen to the, those are supposedly nice brand new sinks. We would will like to buy one? definitely <laughs> find the best possible use for them. Um, and there are enough things that, that uh, at the high school perhaps that will need some replacement or other parts of the of the system or in some way, we, we're certainly not going to just start them. They are handicapped depth, so therefore wherever we need. And we're not talking about large numbers, but we. Such as bathrooms. All bathrooms have the same depth. For a variety of reasons, the best thing to do was to go forward with the project, which had already been substantially completed, mm -hmm. and to handle the replacement as a separate piece would have cost us a lot more to go through the contract and then if we do it. I understand that. I just hated to see the idea of them being no, wasted. Oh, we won't waste They will be disposed of that, that, that benefits the system. The other issue is, too, is the new sinks probably won't come in until November or December. Uh -huh. And so that would have left eight holes in the countertops and all the science classrooms, which didn't make sense for, for that time period either since we already owned Sinks and uh, everything had been done, but actually to install them, it made sense to go ahead. So the, it's workable. There's water. Oh, they're workable. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, any other questions, comments? Next item on the agenda is unfinished business, policy second reading. And We have two policies for second reading tonight. One is athletic trips, file IJOA. And um, the second is the Cape Elizabeth School Department use of facilities, guidelines, and policies. Are there any comments or questions on these policies? Carla? Carla. Um, I'm going to bring it up with the facilities guidelines one, but I know that we all sort of want to put this one to rest. But in the priority order of use section, it had seemed to me that we were still at one point maybe discussing the orders of number six and number seven. And maybe I'm remembering wrong. I know a lot of time went into this, and maybe this is how we ultimately decided to leave it. That, that is how we left it at the last meeting. Yeah. yeah. That, that, was a, that it was a question about whether they should be changed. Um, was that discussed? Any feeling about that? We discussed Fine. every possible option at these number of meetings, but Sue? I think one of the, the reasons we opted not to change it was that um, anyone coming in for private enterprise um, should take a backseat to a nonprofit organization coming in, and I think that was the determining factor. I guess I would still feel, though, that if it was a Cape Elizabeth organization, that would organization <coughs> pays taxes in this town, and that they should get preference over but, uh, and out I, of town. I had one since I served on that committee. One of the um, specifics were, if I remember correctly, music lessons as a profit organization. It would be one individual, and the nonprofit organization tended to be groups. But there's no guarantee that it's, that's always the case. Right. Well, it's that. that's right. It's, we spent a whole morning on this one, I think. <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm still not happy with that, but it just seems to me that Cape Elizabeth should get first, first dibs. I mean, it probably, in the grand scheme of things, does not become an issue all that often. It doesn't. <coughs> it's, it's a matter of classroom space. It's not right. utilizing the large spaces that are highly competitive. It's using um, the prior order really doesn't come into play for that kind of a thing because the only thing that would really bump them would be a school activity or those things that are up much higher on the list. Okay. So I can't think of one case where profit versus non-profit has been a priority issue in terms of using the facility. Well, then would it hurt to switch it? Hmm? Just in a symbolic sense of, you know, um, talking about people. I think people what we need to do is yeah. to take it back to the committee, because it was a committee decision the order was a committee decision with representation from the town council, the school board, and rather than us just, we can go back and bring this concern to them and have them relook at it if you think that's appropriate. Well, I, I guess it's a little frustrating because this was raised in June. How about if we put them together as one priority, that number six becomes um, both Cape Elizabeth profit organizations and other nonprofit organizations sharing that that priority use slot, or does that complicate it? I don't think the committee would have an objection to that. Um, have these all been printed up? No. <laughs> we have um, 12 copies, and I think they're all right here. So they have not been sent, they have not been distributed, and they have not all been printed. Because we all do know that this still gives you flexibility to work within things, and that may just, if it really doesn't come up too much, it may put them on equal footing. Um, you would just make a six and seven and not have an eight. Yeah, that was just one suggestion. Um, I don't know how anybody. Feels about Sorry. It. Well, Charlie, did you? No, I, I was going to raise another issue. No. <laughs> I would like to see this, some closure to this tonight, because we've worked a whole year on this. Well, I know that, but you know, once we approve it, we've approved and we'd like not to review it again. So, I mean, mm. 
a little, I mean, this was brought up in June and it did not apparently get discussed again. Um, it could have been, it should have been because it was raised as an issue. So I think, you know, if we can resolve it tonight, that would be great. I'd, I'd be happy with putting them jointly in there and let it be up to Sue to bump someone if they have to be bumped. Any other questions on that issue? Or Charlie? See, I would agree. I think that anybody who lives in this town, who pays taxes in this town, should have priority over a nonprofit organization from some other, from outside the town. The only, re just the discussion of the committee was a lot of times that nonprofit group from out of town could be someone like Casco Bay Hockey, which has a lot of Cape residents in it, or it could be those kind of things as opposed to a profit group within Cape Elizabeth. And, you know, it just gets a little fuzzy when you try to put everybody into their slot. Can you think of another example of the nonprofit group? I can't think of any that we have turned away mm -hmm. um, because they were in competition with someone else vying for the space. Mm -hmm. And I think the only time it's a real issue is when it's a school activity versus a non-school activity. I mean, those are the, the key things. So I suppose we can change it, but I think it's sort of a non-issue. I've never known it to exist. Well, it really sounds like what you're trying to do is have five and seven come together and six and eight come together seven. in priorities. Mm. I, I just think Cape Elizabeth, whatever it is, should be ahead of everybody else. Frankly, I, I, would, I, I guess I would be a little surprised if uh, a lot of town councilors didn't feel that way too. But I mean, we have situations in, at Fort Williams where out of town um, people have taken up all the facilities and, and uh, Cape people can't use them. And I just think, uh, you know, especially with our nice new facilities, first ac access should be to us. Maybe it's, pure, maybe it's purely symbolic, and if it is, then I don't see what it hurts to change it. Uh, and that leads into my other, my other question is that this has to do with school facilities, and it's interesting to see the priorities set the town, and I understand town emergencies, but elections come before any school mm -hmm. events. But we have no say in um, the use of Fort Williams mm -hmm. or the use of town facilities such as Shore Road or this building. So it's interesting, yeah. especially in a one-town concept. True. That we're not looking at all facilities and one central uh, but That you was don't discussed. <laughs> no, I don't. No. That was discussed. <laughs> well, how about, is this on a word processor that's easy hmm. to change? <laughs> <laughs> how about if we switch the Cape Elizabeth profit organizations to write it, to follow with number six slash the nonprofit organizations outside of Cape Elizabeth and eliminate eight, the number eight, and just have profit organizations outside Cape be seven? I think that's what I suggested, that's just combining them. But I changed the order. Oh, okay. The order of, So okay. the Cape becomes, is first. The Cape Elizabeth Prophet becomes the first one listed. And then nonprofit organizations outside of Cape follows that. And that's my suggestion. But they share the place number six. Yeah. And profit or. that, that I thought that's what Beth said. <laughs> okay. So then community services become Solomon. <laughs> I'm afraid they're that a lot anyway. <laughs> Solomon. Well, we tried to make, help them out there when we were on that committee. Um, is there, are there any further um, discussion on that point or on other points? Well, I think this is very user friendly as opposed to the first draft clearer, more spaces, I guess, between lines. Do I have a motion? Okay, you want to do these separately? Oh, no, oh, it doesn't matter. Um, well, we probably should. Okay. 
Okay, I would uh, move that we accept the Cape Elizabeth School Department use of facilities guidelines and policies with the change of uh, under priority <laughs> order of use. Number six, reading non-profit organizations outside, no, excuse me, Cape Elizabeth profit organizations slash non-profit organizations outside of Cape Elizabeth and changing number eight to number seven. Second. All those in favor? Oh, sorry, is there any discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? Who's the second? Uh, Gail was the second, seven zero. Okay, the second one was athletic trips. My, my only comment would be that we need to add um, a reference at the bottom to the field trip policy, the extended field trip policy. Add what? Any other discussion on it? Anne, motion? Okay, I would move that we accept the athletic trips policy IJOA with the addition of the reference to the extended field trip policy. I second that. Any other discussion? It's been a long time coming. Sure has. <laughs> All those in favor? 7 0. Yeah, could I just add something? Yes. I'm assuming now that the, this will be used. <laughs> that would be good. That would be good. And did you want to announce another meeting? Um, yes, we are going to, the policy uh, subcommittee is going to be meeting tomorrow morning at 8.30 to set up a schedule of meetings for the upcoming year and to um, uh, make, make kind of a preliminary list of some of the issues we're going to cover this year. Uh, next item on the agenda is new business, um, school board preliminary goals. Connie? And since we've already discussed in workshop session, um, this is a sort of combined and perhaps boiled down list. Um, I did, as you noted, uh, as we discussed last week, try to add some wording that was long range goals that I took as much as anything from the mission and vision statements that we have, recognizing that we're gonna go through a process where we re review some of those statements. But um, I thought it was important to try to set these up so that there is some distinction between the looking down the road piece from the short range goals, which are essentially what we will, will set as priorities for this year. Um, the direction, and this is a draft, and I don't uh, ask you to vote on these today. We will take them up again in September. What I would ask you to do is you know, sort of thinking over some of our discussion, and again, I need to summarize some of the implementation issues that the administrators and I were talking about, um, along with some of the realities that I've, I'm becoming aware of in the state education um, agenda, which is, something we hardly talked about because we don't yet know exactly what that is, but that is out there. Um, so it's, a, it's I'm trying to figure out how to have some goals that we can clearly do and that the building principals and staff will, will understand what your priorities are for this year. Um, but also we wanna tell you what the realities are, of what we have to deal with for a variety of reasons. So I don't wanna make this too long and complicated. Um, please look this over and get back to me, either individually or in written form, however you want to do it, um, to give me a clear sense of how you want this, this presented. If, if this is essentially uh, acceptable, let me know. We can take it up again in September. If there are some changes you want made, fine. We don't need to go through it all tonight. You can, you can contact me, as I said, either on the phone or in writing. Just mark this up in any way, and I will try to get back to you in time before our September meeting so that you can see where it's at at that point. Charlie? It's interesting that a lot of the long range goals actually meld into what is our mission. And yeah. So I'm wondering if we really should just more concentrate on what are short term goals, things that we could accomplish this year. 
which I kind of like Beth's suggestion at our workshop. And, and if you want to do that, that's fine with me. I just wanted to really make the point. Uh, I am absolutely convinced that schools get bogged down in short-term goals and that we don't communicate as much as we probably should to the community at large where we're headed. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that plagues schools is the plan of the year. You know, this is the theme of the year. Uh, okay, it's this this year and it's something else next year, and we're, we, we get bogged down in those things. Um, that was my intention in framing it that way, and if that's everybody understands that, we can certainly eliminate that piece, but or put it on a separate sheet or treat it in some other way. I just didn't want it to get lost. Especially since we're going to be looking at the mission and vision statement anyway this year, you know, as kind of a, a theme for our, mm -hmm. our year. But we can all read them and think about it and get some feedback to Connie. Okay. Next item on the agenda is superintendent's nominations for new teachers for the 95-96 school year. And um, perhaps we have a new this, I was going to add the request for the leave. I forgot okay. to say that it would really be become 7B and move everything else down. So why don't I take that first? You have in the papers I gave you just before we started, um, this has happened so recently, I didn't have a chance to send it out to you, a copy of Pam Rossin's letter to Rick. Pam has been a math teacher for a number of years here in the district. Uh, she has been very interested in the math and science initiatives and has been participating both as a uh, member of, of uh, summer work groups and also uh, actually teaching some groups and has been offered an opportunity, as she says here, to serve as a Beacon facilitator for the Brunswick SAD 75 Beacon Center. And for those of you who've been on the board or those of you who are new to the board, I think it was three years ago that the state um, actually awarded seven grants, if I remember correctly, to high schools throughout the state, Beacon Centers, which are, um, gave them extra money to, to uh, develop math and science programs. Um, this is, of course, an opportunity, as her letter uh, goes on to say, that she's very excited about it because it's in an area that she's uh, been doing some work and she'd like to continue. She's not leaving us to be a classroom teacher, and obviously there are some um, uncertainties about these things are funded through grant monies. It's no, never absolutely clear exactly how long the life of, of these particular positions will be. So she is asking for a leave, and in light of the fact for one year leave, uh, which is your practice, you don't grant more than one year leave at a time. Um, it would be certainly consistent with our, our practice in the past to grant a teacher uh, continuing contract um, this opportunity as a leave. Um, and whatever happens, uh, we are right now in the process of looking for um, a suitable replacement. Um, I think clearly we will try to make that a number one priority at the high school. I know Rick is already working on Questions and comments? Anne? Um, I, I think there's some really nice things about this, but as has happened in the past, I, I, have a, I have a problem with this because of the lateness of the hour, so to speak. Um, this is, it seems to me this might be a hard time to fill this position. And also, um, I guess I, I feel uncomfortable with the um, possibility that this might not be just one year, but two years. I think, I think it makes it hard on the system to find uh, find a suitable replacement. And I really not very happy about the lateness of the hour. I understand things come up at the last minute, but Carla, I'm also a, a little bit uncomfortable with the two year thing because it. It means that we won't know until the same time next year whether or not she's coming back or not and whether or not we're going to need to find a, yet another replacement. And in finding the replacement this year, you know, it's hard to know. We're telling someone one year, but it might be two years. Well, you can only ask one year under our, our guidelines right. on this anyway. Right. And our guidelines do ask her to make a decision. 
um, to contact us with what she believes the situation will be by March. Um, it is certainly true that these kind of grant opportunities, for instance, may not be able to give her an indication at that, at that timeline, but that is what we ask people to do, be in touch with us on that. Um, and uh, again, if it goes well and she wants to go back a second year, you have um, another shot at deciding what you want to do. And, and we, can, we can make that, according to our contract, a timeline, uh, whether it works for her or not, that has to be uh, certainly no later than June. So we can, we can handle that piece of it better than we can this. And in all fairness to Pam, this is something that uh, the, the assistant superintendent at, um, at uh, SAD 75 called me to apologize. They certainly understand what an awkward situation this puts us in. Uh, it's one of those domino effect things. Somebody left them, you know, at a, in a, at a time sequence where they needed to fill the position and so forth. Um, so it's not really, it's just one of those things that can happen. I get, I, I, not to pick on Pam, I mean, this is a great opportunity for her. Obviously, she's well thought of. She's a good teacher, and it's too bad to leave, lose her teaching um, for a year or maybe two. But um, I, I guess it just bothers me that when we come to contractual issues, you know, our, <laughs> we uphold our end by you know giving people their contracts and honoring our contracts, but we have a continuous issue um, with with teachers um, breaking their contracts. Um, you know, out of out of sequence, which makes it very difficult for us. Charlie, I usually agree with Ann. You know, especially with the lateness of this particular person. But I do see something gained by her doing this. It's not going to be a teaching job, but more of a facilitator, so that she's going to be uh, almost a someone, a resource, and a resource that she will gather data. Which, which, when she does come back, is going to be more of an asset to our system, especially when we're moving in these areas of technology curriculum uh, delivery and the use of, of technology in the delivery of classroom curriculum. So I, I see a very positive things. I, I am distressed at the lateness of the hour, but I also see the positive feedbacks of, some, of her coming back to the system. Other comments? I just wanted to comment that I do see the value of this particular position um, and what Pam would bring back to us. I, I, this has nothing to do with Pam. I just, um, I hope leave of absences are used by teachers to bring something back to us and not to try out a new job for a year to see how it works out and then, and then leave us. Um, because I think that's very difficult and we, we are, generous in granting leave of absences, and I hope that it will come back to us with, um, with all the things we're hoping for. Any other discussion? Charlie? You ready for a motion? Oh yeah, I'll take the motion, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. I move the request for leave of absence for one year of Pam Ross in high school math. Is there a second? Second. Gail? All those in favor? Six. All those opposed, one. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the, um, the next nomination of new teachers. Um, the high school part-time, four-tenths French and Spanish position, Sonia Medina. Uh, happens to be somebody who, let me see if I can get this right, was raised in France, right? But has a Spanish mother, father, which is it? <laughs> right. But anyway, she's thoroughly bilingual. We, we were very fortunate in finding her. Um, high school, middle school, speech language therapist, uh, Mary Hudson. And also, uh, as a reminder to you that uh, during the budget process, we had you had approved an extension on the staffing and the social studies position. We held off to the final moment because we were concerned that any of those new requests, if we were to lose subsidy, would be a problem. And um, since we did not lose subsidy, we have now gone ahead and filled those positions. 
Hannah Ashley is not a new teacher, but we are extending her contract from four tenths to nine tenths. Nine tenths sounds a little strange. It's because she'll be teaching five classes one semester and four classes the second semester. And you could take a, a uh, combined vote on all of those. Any discussion? I have a motion. Gail? I move that we uh, approve the nominations of Sonia Medina for the high school French Spanish, Mary Hudson for the high school middle school speech language therapist, and Hannah Ashley from four tenths to nine tenths high school social studies. Is there a second? Second that. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Seven zero. Next item is co curricular. Co curricular, and it's freshman boys soccer, Charlie Carroll, freshman girls soccer, Craig Roberts, eighth grade girls soccer, Roy Dunphy, seventh grade field hockey, Ann St. John, and golf, Brian Bickford, uh, and assistant athletic director throughout the year, Janet Hoskin. I should explain that that is a position that Sam Boothby used to hold and called house manager. Um, what we have discovered from Sam's attempts to straighten out his retirement is that the Retirement Commission does not recognize a position called house manager and told us in looking at our the existing job description that that is an assistant athletic director. So the, this is not a new position. It is simply a different title for a position that's, that is in the co-curricular schedule. And it, that might be one vote, although actually you can do this all as one vote. Um, under co-curricular, not athletic, the high school choral music director, Lori Turley, you may recall that in our report on co-curricular uh, assignments for next year, we recommended establishing a new position, or we, if you can recall the sheet, we kind of divided some of the positions that were there uh, so that we will now have a choral music director. Lori has certainly done a wonderful job for us in, in her current assignment and we're pleased that she's interested in doing this. Any questions? Chuck? Just a clarification <clears throat> on the high school choral music co-curricular position this will now be a non-academic course. Yes this is co-curricular. Yeah I just want to, because it had choral has been a. Ah yes yes. There will be mm. no chorus during the school time. Day. Right it will be an after school activity. Carla? What happened to the seventh grade girls soccer? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure there was. What was the name you, you missed? You didn't read that name when you read the list over. The seventh grade girls soccer, there was a, on my list. There's that was taken away. It was away. on an original list that we oh, had. That was, it was on a previous away. list. Right. Something has happened with that particular person, and I don't know exactly the, what. The person. So does that position still exist in limbo somewhere? Yeah. They're looking for someone, probably. Okay. I, I believe we're still. I believe we're still looking for a seventh grade girls soccer coach and then seventh grade and eighth grade boys soccer coach. Okay. Right. We should be able to bring those to you in September with these practices. Right. At this point, I, they have been advertised, but we do not have people. Okay. And. Maybe I'm wrong, but I seem to remember in June that we asked that when we had coaching positions and co-curricular positions brought in front of us who were not people on staff, that we have some little bio on them um, so that we knew something about the people we were voting on. So are they, is that everyone on this list? Yeah, I mean, Lori, Lori Turley is in the system mm -hmm. as a teacher awesome. and Janet. Um, Craig Roberts. And Craig Roberts, <laughs> but some of these people are not. I mean, I know who some of them are, but mm -hmm. um, again, I think it would be very helpful to have a, a little bit of background information on these people. Okay. Any other questions, comments? <coughs> Motion? I move uh, acceptance of the Recommendations for freshman boys soccer, Charlie Carroll, freshman girls soccer, Craig Roberts, eighth grade girls soccer, Roy Dunphy, seventh grade field hockey, Ann St. John, golf, Brian Bickford, assistant athletic director, year long position, Janet Hoskin, and the co curricular position, high school choral music director, Laura, Laurie Turley. Is there a second? 
Anne? Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. Uh, next um, item on the agenda is ratification of sec secretarial contract, and we are going to table that tonight. We are not ready. And the next item is discussion and action on computer lease package. We are also going to table that as not being ready. Is there any other business? Seeing none, I'd like to announce the next meeting of the school board is Tuesday, September 12th, 6.30 finance committee meeting, 7.30 regular school board meeting. The building committee meeting was already mentioned. Um, and there's a substitute teacher information meeting on Tuesday, August 29th at 9 a.m. Do I have a motion that we adjourn? So moved. So moved. Seconded. All those in favor? Meeting is adjourned.